Again, good afternoon, everyone. This is Erica Young at Smart Growth America. We're going to go ahead and get going. Um, you may have seen in the in your browser, um, there's a note about directing all questions to the chat box. Throughout the webinar today, if you would like to ask a question, you're more than welcome to type it in at any time and post it, and then we'll get to the questions at the end of the presentation. Um, but again, thank you for joining us, and we're going to get going today to talk about the Rehab Act um, and also how it's a way to think about changing some federal legislation that will help us do better and more smart growth development. So with that, I'm going to jump in. For those of you who don't know us, Smart Growth America um, is an organization, a 501c3 national nonprofit that is headquartered in Washington, D.C. And really what we do um, and what our mission is, is to make sure that no matter who you are or where you live, that you can enjoy living in a place that's healthy, prosperous, and resilient. We often do this through things like advocacy of the kind that we're talking about here today. Um, technical assistance, I see a number of names on here before that have engaged with us in that technical assistance program, and also thought leadership. We often do this through our community of programs. You may have worked and or belonged to one of these. Um, organizations like LOCUS, which is really the primary team that we have running point on the Rehab Act here today. Um, you may have come to us through our First and Main Coalition. Um, you may also work with Transportation for America on a number of transportation advocacy um, initiatives um, or any one of the other number of teams that we have here. So today, you're going to be, well, I'm going to be speaking. Again, I'm the Director of Strategic Partnerships here at SGA. We're also going to be joined by Jeff Zarco, um, who's the Principal of Economic Policy Strategies. For those who don't know me, um, I really run a lot of our outreach and coalition building work here at SGA. So a lot of the great ideas and great work that we do, I try to make sure that you're aware of it, you know ways in which you can engage with it, and um, I really also seek that feedback to, in, to figure out how it's working on the ground, what it looks like, what it feels like, and if it's working for you or not. Um, Jeff uh, um, is an independent consultant with us through Economic Policy Strategies, um, and he's really been working on economic and tax policy for gosh, over a decade, um, at least over a decade on the Hill alone, I think, um, and really is a respected member of the economic and tax policy community here in Washington. Um, he was a senior economic policy advisor for the House Ways and Means Committee um, under its former ranking member, Congressman Levin of Michigan, um, and also was a member of the committee tax staff and responsible for policy analysis and legislative strategy with respect to things like tax reform, the extension in back in 2001 and 2003, um, tax cuts work, job creation work, muni finance, uh, the debt limit, and macroeconomic policy. So really, a really wide range of topics within that um, often specific uh, issue of tax policy. Um, he's also, while working on Capitol Hill, worked on a number of pieces of legislation that you may have heard of, like the Middle Class Tax Relief and Job Creation Act of 2012, um, the Small Business Jobs Act of 2010, um, the Economic Recovery Act in 2008, the Economic Stimulus Act in 2008, um, really in a whole host of other, of other topics. Um, he comes to us from Michigan, and also as a fellow Michigander, I promise you that I'm not doubling up and trying to expand our network um, just in Michigan, but it is nice to, to meet a fellow, uh, a fellow uh, Michigander. Um, but he does come to us through Michigan State University um, for, an, for his undergrads and, and also an MA in Applied Economics from Johns Hopkins University. So we will be talking to you both today um, really on two sides of a coin about community development, um, really how has communities, community development changed, what the role of the federal government is here, because I know that's always a question when we talk about local um, and or state policy, you know, why should the federal government be involved here? Um, how are we as a community being led by our LOCUS team really responding to this need? And then also what you can help us do to understand how to effectuate this change. So I'm going to start with, I'm just going to level set for a minute. I know a number of you already work with us and have probably already seen some of these slides in this presentation. Um, but I want to make sure that we're all on the same page. So the state of community development, how are we where we are? Um, so I want you to go back in your way back machine, or maybe your not so way back machine, um, and really talk about how, you know, the zoning, a very specific topic, but 
um, the way we've built our communities really just in our lifetimes has, has been an example of what we call Euclidean zoning. And it's an extreme separation of where we live, where we shop, and where we work. So you have a community center, you've got your big box store, and you've got your downtown with your office spaces, and never the twain shall meet. Um, and really what that means is that you're always getting in your car going different places. So it's very auto-centric planning. It, it creates a hierarchy of roads, um, highways instead of streets, right? Um, pedestrians are an afterthought, if thought of at all, um, as we have shown in a number of our reports. Um, so what that looks like is this. We have an industrial center that has certain, you know, a state will offer certain tax credits to lure those to this perhaps area they've, they've zoned industrial and laid out. Um, we've got our shopping centers where we go to buy groceries um, and maybe a movie theater. And then we have our residential areas where we specifically live and do very little else. What that looks like for residential, I'm sure many of you either have this community or maybe still live in this community. Um, what that means is that this is what we have to live in, this is what we have to shop in, and this is what we have to work in. Um, so the question is, like, you know, what's changed? And a number of you have been with us there throughout this process. So I want to thank you for that. Really sense if we're going to draw a line in the sand, we're going to say 2000, things have really started to change. Companies started moving downtown again. Um, a lot of this was driven, as you know, by consumer preference, both, both millennial and baby boomer. The baby boomers are retiring. The millennials are graduating from college. They both want different life experiences, but they both want it in the same place. Um, and also the rise of the knowledge economy, where you could, really could kind of work from anywhere. Um, so as a result, in part, traditional town plans are really rising in popularity again because it gives people that certain mix of, of activities that they really want. Um, as you may have seen, our core values report really documented a lot of that move back downtown from a corporate standpoint. Um, really either companies were forming in downtown, they were moving from exurbs and suburbs back into downtown, um, a whole host of reasons. You can find it online still. It's got a, a great wealth of information and specific examples of companies that have done that over a certain period of time. What we really saw was, and it wasn't an accident um, that this happened, this is a stated desire of many site selectors for companies. The walk scores in the before versus the after locations dramatically, you know, rose dramatically. And the same thing for the transit scores and the bike scores. Co these companies really wanted places where people were not locked into that office park. Um, and that was what they were looking for. So a number of communities that already had this or were working on this, uh, one in that, in that type of a lottery, or the communities that were um, really aggressive about it worked with those, co those companies to try and remake their downtowns. So I'm moving right through this because I really want to want to uh, get to what the Rehab Act is about. But you know, so why are we involving the federal government in this? If communities built one way, why can't they just build their way out of it? Um, and really, what that means is that you know, cities are really a partner in this. They're not a stakeholder. They raise taxes. They have legal authority over the way their communities are built. Um, they aren't really the ones, and I'm sure you guys have heard this if you're involved with the National League of Cities or the National Association of Counties or the U.S. Conference of Mayors, that cities and counties and communities are units of government that are co-equal um, you know, units of government with their state and their, federal, and their federal partners. And what they need is a strong, reliable partner in the federal government because, as I've just mentioned, a lot of what we've seen is that talent is replacing that traditional um, highway expansion, tax credit, um, kind of uh, tax incentive as an economic development tool in America. And we've heard this time and again from the chambers we work with, from the companies we've reached out to. Um, it's less about giving me you know, attractive land and an off-ramp. It's more about giving me visibility and access to some kind of trail or some kind of green space or a vibrant downtown. But the problem is, and this is where the federal government comes into play, really since World War II, uh, when the rise of the suburbs happened, we have gradually retooled our tax incentive program to make sure that we um, were able to give everybody a home in a backyard. Well, that doesn't work when we start adding more and more people going from 
similar places to the exact same place. That leads to things like congestion that we then think we should build our way out of by building wider highways. Um, and really what people want is the ability to, to you know, live and work and play, and that's, a, you know, I know that you guys have heard that term before, in a similar place. Um, but when our federal tax code still heavily prioritizes things like the home mortgage interest deduction for really any house you have anywhere in the country um, over things like a low-income housing tax credit that's going to meet um, a lot of the needs of our low-income residents, um, you know, the community development fund, or really these are just a couple of, um, of examples of the type of tax, uh, tax incentives that benefit people who are specifically in a more smart growth community, um, a more densified area, than it does for sprawl. So what we have done at the, federal, as, at the federal level is really written a tax structure that incentivizes that low density, sprawling type of, um, type of development. Um, and if we really want to be thoughtful of how we change that, we have to start thinking about how we change the tax structure involved. Now, so Jeff is right here with me. And we have, I know you're thinking, but we have a number of tax incentives. Um, why aren't we using those more? And I've listed some of those tax incentives here about what some of the tools are for mayors, um, mayors and county commissioners and, and the like. Um, they're obviously really outpaced by things like the new home mortgage interest deduction. Um, so the size and the scale are just fundamentally different, but it's also speaking kind of at a different at a different specific scale, wouldn't you say, Jeff? Absolutely, um, and I think it's worth noting that um, you know the home mortgage interest deduction because it because it really uh, creates incentives for for individual families to buy more housing than they really need. Mm -hmm. re de de deliberately uh, contributes to that that sprawl. Um, I think it's worth noting that Locus, um, you know, is the is Smart Growth America's uh, you know, private developer group, yep. and um, all of Locus's developers work with all of these incentive programs all the time, and some of them have really been, been leaders in, um, you know, in, in, in each one of these programs, uh, both at the federal level and in coming up with uh, innovative financing techniques at the local level. Um, but what, they've really, what they really said to, to, to Smart Growth America was, you know these programs are great, but there's there's clearly um, a size issue. But it all, they also aren't really designed in a way that reflects um, the way development actually happens. Um, new markets is is focused um, on commercial property. Historic tax credits are focused on uh, on historic rehabilitation. Um, I always say, you know, historic tax credits have become part of the capital stack of every downtown redevelopment project in the country. Um, I'm not sure that's really what it was designed for. I certainly don't have any problem with that, but um, it, you know, it's not the it's not the tool you would have designed for that task. Um, low income housing tax credits, um, you know, far and away the the largest of these programs, um, you know, it, significantly oversubscribed across the country, uh, and very difficult to integrate with other incentives. So, um, you know, all of these. Uh, all of these very specific uh, sort of one policy objective credits um, leave, really make it very difficult to achieve the kind of mixed use, mixed income developments that, that our downtown areas really need. Um, and even opportunity zones, I would know, you know, we're, we'll, we, we shall see how that program evolves, but but certainly the feedback that we're getting from a lot of Locus members is that, um, you know, this is, a, this is a program that makes a profitable investment more profitable, but if you're trying to, if you're trying to close the, the gap in a capital stack for a project, uh, Opportunity Zones just, just doesn't, doesn't meet that need. It's just a different kind of program. Um, so if we want to skip ahead. Yeah, so we're going to start talking about the Rehab Act now just to transition. Um, really what we've done so far is give you guys an idea of the way communities are developing is fundamentally changing. I know many of you are feeling that in your communities, um, why we would be looking to change things on the federal level. So now what we're going to do, and Jeff is going to lead this portion of the conversation, is really talk about what an idea is that we have a proposal because it's not yet introduced. Um, but a proposal that we have to really work on 
fixing some of those uh, those issues. So I'm going to jump into it, and Jeff is just going to tell me when he wants to move slides forward, and I'll get on it. Sounds great. Um, right. So as, as I said, you know, our existing federal in incentives tend to be narrowly focused on a very particular policy objective, rather than the sort of multifaceted project that we that we really want to encourage. Um, also, all of those uh, uh, programs are um, are pretty well oversubscribed. Uh, so you know, there's there's far more demand uh, for federal incentives than there are resources. Um, all three of those programs, uh, the main federal tax incentives have a, a pre-approval process either at the federal or state level um, that can have the, the unintended effect of making them very difficult to work with uh, except for the largest or most sophisticated developers. Um, and to, you know, to play off what Erica said, I think the result of all of this is that you know, we're, we're, we're living in a world where um, despite the fact that we know that people want, people and companies want to be in these, you know, in smart growth environments where uh, people can live, work, and play in close proximity to each other, the market continues to overwhelmingly provide sort of that that old model drivable suburban housing, um, even as that that demand is shifting, uh, which is which is one of the reasons, um, you know, that prices in attractive urban markets are just going through the roof. Uh, we all live here in Washington, D.C., and you know, with that every day, but it, it's, it's happening um, in, in communities all across, across the country. Um, you know, there's, there's most, demar most desirable segments of the market, um, you know, prices are, 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 are just soaring. Mm -hmm. So I'm go to the next slide. Um, so as, as, a, as a broad overview, I mean, this, this picture really is just designed to give you you know, a sense of the of the, of the change in outlook. Um, you know, the the rehab credit, the, the neighborhood rehabilitation credit. Um, you know, it builds off of what some of you some of you may be familiar with the old 10 percent credit uh, under the under that was part of the the historic credit. Uh, it was it was a, a lower credit rate for non-historic buildings that were built before 1936, and the approach was. You know, you, you see, you've got like the little, uh, you know, the, the 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 one commercial space in a, you know, in a small downtown area. You know, it's an old bank or storefront, um, and you could use the historic credit, if it, or the or the 10% rehabilitation credit, to to help rehabilitate that one building. But as as you all know better than than we do, that one building um, still, you know, if it's sitting on a block that, uh, you know, full of other buildings. That, that need the same kind of rehabilitation, but that don't qualify or can't or otherwise can't get access to that support, um, you know, that's not going to be a very successful prog uh, project. So we wanted to move to to a to a broader frame where we where we say not, instead of focusing on one building, you know, how do we how do we create an incentive that supports a whole pro a project that's going to rehabilitate a whole block and that's going to include a mix of commercial and residential uses, um, you know, all while encouraging, uh, you know, affordability. So if we go to the next slide, um, what we came up with is a, is a project-based credit um, that, that, as I said, incentivizes, um, you know, renovation of whole neighborhoods equitably. Design from it from its inception for mixed use mixed income projects um, to get access to the credit you do store because we're sort of coming out of this you know rehabilitation credit uh, model um, we start with a qualifying building and a qualifying building is one that's at least 50 years old um, and so that's and that that's from you know when the project is is taking place. Um, that comes from the fact that uh, you know when the when the rehabilitation credit was enacted in 1986, um, they they made the the 1936 deadline. Um, so it was 50 years prior to the to to when that legislation was enacted. But then they just left it there. So the stock of eligible buildings, um, you know, was reduced year after year. And and in some and in newer communities, no, you know, nothing was ever going to qualify. So you need an old building, at least 50 years old, and then and it also has to be within a half mile of existing or of an existing or planned transit facility. So you want to you need um, you know an old building plus close to close to transit. From there we say okay, instead of just the the the, the 
um, uh, the, the money you spend renovating that one building, um, and previously that was always commercial, we expand to, to residential mixed use. We also say, you know what, if there are adjacent properties that you want to include in this project, if you want to expand the building, if you, want, if you need to build something new next door, you can do that um, as long as you stay on the same block. And so that's a way of, of limiting it from getting too far from you know, your, your originally qualifying building, but reflecting uh, you know, what, could, what could potentially be a fairly large uh, project. Those costs are all eligible for um, you know, a 15% tax credit. Um, but then we also say, uh, we also recognize, and it's one of the things we hear most from, from um, the developers who, are, who make up Locus, is that they, is in their projects, they spend a lot of money upgrading public infrastructure. Sewer lines, sidewalks, roads, um, other utilities, and it's just, you know, the, the municipality that they're working with, you know, is very encouraging in the project, but simply doesn't have the resources um, to, to do those uh, upgrades, and so the developer ends up doing them, and there's really no way to, to monetize those expenditures. Um, so we say, you know, if you're doing that, uh, your credit gets a 10% bonus, and so we give you 25% of, of those costs. Likewise, if, um, if the rental housing that you're including in the project um, is, uh, is attainable, which means you know, rent restricted and um, occupied by folks who make um, you know, no more than the area median, uh, then you also get that 10% bonus. So um, as you can see, trying to combine um, a, a number of different concepts here, but in a way that is flexible, reflects how development is actually taking place. Um, it's currently envisioned as a as a incentive that is not sort of capped um, nationally, so uh, and not requiring um, a federal pre-approval. So you would have obviously you still have to deal with you have to meet any you know local requirements, but um, you know. You're not applying to a to a state housing development authority for credits or or to the treasury department. Um, you know, if you have a qualifying project, you can proceed and then file your tax return, which, hopefully, which we hope will uh, you know broaden uh, the set of developers uh, who will be interested in working with it. Um, that I think is a you know an overview of of what the credit is. Mm -hmm. um, we want to talk a little bit about process? Yeah, absolutely. So just as a reminder, we see some of the questions coming in. We're definitely going to get to those. Um, by way of housekeeping, we're sending out the PowerPoint. We're recording this, so we'll send that out as well. We've updated the one pager that was linked in the invitation, so we have a new one there. We'll send that out as well. Um, so that's the housekeeping stuff. Um, the process this is still a proposal. This isn't legislation is introduced. And one of the reasons we're reaching out to you all is because we want to get feedback on the concepts. We want to know if there are certain aspects you guys really like. You know, I think one of the questions on here from Larissa about the implications for rural areas is a really valid question um, that we want to we would want to figure out. We've probably been I've not been in the room blissfully. Um, I ran away from the hill and never looked back. Um, but we would definitely want to get some, some eyes on and have some answers about things like the implications for rural. And I know one of the questions here about like how is transit fa facility defined, um, you know, you would typically see that in legislation that is introduced. So there has to be some kind of idea there. Um, so I think, uh, the, you know, talking about what the next steps are, where we go from here, what a timeline looks like, um, and then also figuring out a process to maybe answer some questions. I know I have a question or two about the implications for this on things like brownfields remediation and development, um, as, and also like the relationship between a, the historic tax credit and this particular tax incentive um, uh, because of you know the different types of people we're thinking about bringing to the table. And I know a number of the communities here, uh, whenever I talk about new development in an area, specifically on the Complete Streets team, one of the first questions is, oh, I have this historic downtown, what can we do with that? Um, so uh, let's start with process, and then we'll get into answering some questions and talking about how to, how to move this particular um, effort forward a little bit. Sure. So just in terms of where we are in the process, we want to go to the, the next slide. Um, you know, we, 
Locus um, is currently working with uh, a couple of members of Congress to, to draft and introduce this. Mm -hmm. um, we're working with, with Congressman Blumenauer from, from the Portland area mm -hmm. and Congressman Kelly um, from the Erie, Pennsylvania a, uh, area, so a, a bipartisan uh, a duo um, that, that work on, on, on these kinds of issues together a lot, actually. Um, so if there are, particularly if there are you know, fo folks from, from Oregon or Pennsylvania, uh, you know, we're particularly, uh, you know, interested in having folks as, as part of the team who can, mm -hmm. uh, you know, reinforce for, for those folks how important this is back home. Um, and, and that's really, I think, you know, the, the message. Um, you know, this is, uh, you know, we're, we're, we're selling a, a, a new idea here, mm -hmm. and the most important thing is that members of Congress um, can see how this will would would work and and, and make a difference in in their communities and so we really need your help um, to to think about the kinds of places kinds of projects uh, where where this incentive uh, would be applicable where it could where it could really spark the transformation of that mm -hmm. of that wonderful historic downtown area um, because that's the kind of thing that really motivates uh, you know, motivates members to, to prioritize something. Mm -hmm. um, and we're seeing, you know, we, we, we certainly see that there is a lot of interest in looking in this area, looking at this area. Um, you know, there was, I think, a feeling that, uh, you know, the, the, um, the 2017 tax legislation, um, you know, obviously made some changes to the historic credit uh, that, that made that a, a somewhat less useful tool. Um, you know, there's, uh, it, uh, we're certainly seeing on Capitol Hill, um, you know, a, a lot of interest uh, in, 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 in this proposal, but also in, in other ways, uh, in, you know, members have other proposals um, uh, to, to, uh, to support um, economic development in their communities. So I think there is a, you know, a growing desire to, to legislate in this area. So. Mm -hmm. Um, it's really about telling those stories and making sure that uh, you know that members are are hearing about this not just from you know folks like you know me in Washington, mm -hmm. but um, you know more importantly that they're hearing about it from uh, you know from their communities back home. Great. So then, just to answer one of the questions that we got, um, how are we currently defining a transit facility? Sure. Because obviously that has implications for the geographic applicability of this particular tool. Sure. Um, we're using, uh, and this is, uh, um, uh, well, I would say we are using the uh, Federal Transit Administration's definition of, um, you know, a, of a fixed guideway transit facility. Uh. So this is going to include, you know, train stations, light rail stations, um, bus rapid transit stations, uh, streetcars, uh, ferry terminals, um, things that are sort of fixed. Um, you know, one, I, it would not include, you know, a bus stop, mm -hmm. uh, an intermodal tra uh, transit facility desk, mm -hmm. but something, uh, you know, it sort of has to be a, a, a fixed facility. Um, so that's how we're, we're currently thinking about that. And, um, you know, Christopher Coase, who's the director of LOCUS, is much more the transportation expert than I am. Mm -hmm. but, uh, so that's probably about as far as I can That's fair. Go so, on that I answer. mean, I think for a number of, I think you've given enough uh, meat on that particular question. We can always, we can always get more specific in the follow-up. Um, you know, I think Larissa's question here about is there any way for rural areas that have no transit facility infrastructure to be exempted from the requirement of being within a half a mile of a transit facility? Um, yes to that specific question, but more broadly, given that rural places without transit are far greater than places with this kind of transit. Mm -hmm. um, what has been the thinking in the crafting of this conversation and proposal about how we work with or address the needs of rural America as it relates to even, you know, getting the spark for a certain kind of redevelopment that could, in fact, be the generator for things like transit? Right. Um, it's something we struggle with. Mm -hmm. um, you know, we've, we've tried, we've looked at different concepts and getting at those 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 small smaller rural downtowns, um, and I mean, I think to be clear, I think there is a, uh, you know, I think there's 
I think it's important to, uh, for, for in every iteration of this, we've been trying to figure out how does that rural downtown get into this, not necessarily, um, you know, I think just waiving that requirement um, probably wouldn't work because now you're sort of talking about anywhere, yeah. including a, you know, including sort of a, an, an, an ex-urban right. place that just happens, you know, to be And we want to be cognizant of the fact that we're not trying to create development into green fields and corn fields. Right. Right. So that was one of the thoughts that went into how do we structure this so that we are incentivizing redevelopment and not incentivizing brand new development that could be considered sprawl. Right. And and um, you know there's also there's also just in terms of feasibility there's a um, you know, there's a cost element to this too, right? Okay. Like, so the, the 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 larger you know the larger portion of the, the the existing built environment that is eligible, the more the more expensive it will be, mm -hmm. um, at least from a congressional scorekeeping scorekeeping standpoint. So there's a balance there. I, I think you know the the question of um, you know communities without that kind of 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 fixed transit, um, you know, is an is an ongoing conversation actually, and I think there's a um, there's an interest in, in, in looking at it. Um, I don't think we've cracked that nut yet, and yeah. so there, we're, we're sort of going ahead with crafting the legislative language, um, you know, sort of a pin in that question. Right. Um, I think one thing that I would be interested to know more about, um, and Larissa, I know I keep calling out your name, but I'm going to come back to this. Uh, I would be interested to know more about what the type of community looks like, maybe that you're thinking of, if we if we stripped out the transit component altogether, right? There's still the other components of needing a building as an anchor that's at least you know 50 years old, um, and a few other components. So it isn't as though we're saying like build anywhere you want because you have to have had a building there, correct? Um, I would be interested to know what the place looks like without that transit component. So maybe we could visualize. Um, we could visualize the concern and the issue, which might lead us to an answer on that type of development. So if there's a place in your community that you're thinking about right now, um, I would, you know, send me here, one second. This is, these are our contact info. Um, send me a link or even maybe an article about that particular area, or even if you have some renderings of what that area looks like or what you want to do with it. Um, I'd love to know more about the type of neighborhood you're thinking of, or the type of maybe, um, you know, the type of block you're thinking of. Um, sometimes I feel like when I can visualize something, that leads me to an answer a little bit better than, um, you know, conceptualizing it. Uh, so that would be, I think, one way for us to continue to continue to have that conversation about, you know, what about small town America? What about rural America? Um, so that we can just kind of be true to that idea of not incentivizing sprawl, but then also really crafting something that's more broadly applicable um, and also has, you know, some new tool for not um, not like metro or urban America. And I, and I know, I mean, having spent some time looking at, um, having, having spent some time looking at, 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 at maps of, of cities of lots of different sizes, mm -hmm. um, you know, you, like I don't, Necessarily think of Erie, Pennsylvania, as a place with a lot of transit, right. uh, but they have both a ferry terminal. They have a ferry terminal. They have an intermodal mm -hmm. bus facility, and they have a train station all in their downtown. And so, actually, it's a a, a, a pretty good chunk of downtown Erie yeah. is 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 eligible on that front. And then, and um, you know, I would I would I would venture that a fair number of the of the buildings in that radius mm -hmm. are, are over 50 years old. So, And I would say there's another um, that I'm thinking of, an intermodal facility in, in downtown Huntington, West Virginia, which obviously not a, a booming metropolis, um, but is was the main city for the member of Congress I used to work for. Um, and he they built an intermodal facility downtown, <coughs> excuse me, that was the anchor for the bus service. Um, a parking facility for downtown as well. Like it, it met a couple of different needs, and it is a physical structure that is a federally designated intermodal facility, which is you know is related to bus infrastructure um, and would, under this definition, be eligible for that. And I know that they were able to use that as a central anchor for a lot of the redevelopment 
that got ticked off in downtown Huntington around Pullman Square. Um, and you know, Huntington's just doing some great things now. Um, I'm really glad to be able to say like I helped them start that off. Um, but you know, that's um, definitely a way to think about it. Um, Robert has a question as well about the formula for attainable housing. Um, and it says 30% of X percentage AMI. Are you, can you speak more about the formula for attainable housing or is that a follow up we should do? No, I mean the, the, um, the, the definite, we, we're using a similar concept to, to LIHTC, um, mm -hmm. except, so it has to be rent restricted, um, but we're, we're talking about a population that's sort of up to the area median. Um, so, so this isn't, I mean, this isn't low income housing, it's, it's attainable, attainable housing. We use that word, uh, specifically, um, you know, whether you want, you know, some folks use workforce housing, mm -hmm. um, you know, we're trying to, uh, um, we're trying to, um, you know, encourage, again, encourage mixed use. So, um, you know, that, that's where we are now, uh, you know, certainly, um, you know, integrating, uh, a, a LIHTC, um, you know, some, uh, a LIHTC project into into uh, a project that uses this is is something we're interested in in trying to facilitate. Mm -hmm. um, but at the moment, it's it's sort of in that uh, you know we're thinking in terms of of, of not you know um, restricting it just to to the lowest income households. Great. Um. That's really everything we have. If anyone else has any other questions, we're looking, we're happy to answer them at this time. I will say part of the follow-up I'd like to do to this web do for this webinar, uh, one, get you the information we talked about today. Um, but two, maybe have a conversation with those individuals who might be interested in feeling out and putting some meat on the bone with respect to this proposal. Um, especially if, you know, as I mentioned, if you have an idea of where this might work in your community. I would love to know what that is. Um, we're in the stage of generating a lot of um, ideas and visuals for uh, for people to use to say, yes, I could actually see myself in this in this solution. Um, but then also any kind of questions, follow-up questions you might have um, that pertain to the relationship between this and perhaps another type of tax credit you use um, would also be good to find out at this stage so that we can really consider the relationship between the two. You know, for example, we obviously wouldn't want to inadvertently um, make it conflict with another thing that you're using in a certain way. You know, all legislation has both unintended positive and negative consequences. Um, is there draft legislation that is available currently? Uh, no, we're um, we are we are waiting on a draft back. Um, I, the our our the, the staff we're working with actually. Um, are hoping that that will be available next week, but that's um, you know subject to the to the, the vagaries of staff, of uh, resources in the Office of Legislative Council and on on the Hill. You and mean Legislative Council that's literally in a markup right now. <laughs> right. So so uh, Erica is referencing the fact that that also open on our conference table here is uh, a live stream of uh, of the House Ways and Means Committee marking up a, a series of tax bills. So so yes, it is true that the the the, the person um, that uh, that that is drafting this bill is, is 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 literally sitting in a markup right now, and so um, you know clearly not working on it at the moment. But uh, <laughs> hopefully, once the markup is is done today, uh, you know we'll have a little more bandwidth. Um, but we we certainly hope to have a um, a, a draft, um, you know, to to get people's feedback on uh, um, as soon as possible. Uh, we've um, just. By way of background, this is a, you know, for those of you who who clicked on the the, the link to the description, um, you know, in the webinar invite, may have noticed that what I've described here is a little bit different. Um, that reflects some, uh, you know, some some changes that and feedback we've gotten mm -hmm. from, uh, you know, from folks on the hill. And right. so it, the, um, legislation so, always evolves as the process moves forward and, and so we're real time negotiation. Exactly. So we're, we're redrafting, but hope to get that, hope to be able to get that to you uh, soon. Perfect. Um, Colorado Springs has a question. I know that this is for a half a mile rehabilitation. How far does that transit station have to, how, yeah, how far does that transit station have to be 
Can it be a mile from the area if a park separates the redevelopment from, or the development of from the transit station? Sorry, did I say that? Let me say that again. No, 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 I got you. Um, no, it's a good question and, and one, you know, we've been asked. It, we're, we're trying to get at, what we're trying to get at is, the, is sort of the, uh, you know, Christopher, if he were here, mm -hmm. would talk about the walk shed of a, of a, of a space, right. um, which was a new term to me. Um, I think, you know, we're, what we're trying to get at is, is walkability. Mm -hmm. So, um, you know, that, I would say that is a, a dial that, you know, yeah. we, you know, we, we're flexible on. Um, and, and I think it's certainly, a, I think it's a fair point and one we should consider because what we're trying to get at is, you know, it, what is the, what is the range that people, you know, would reasonably walk to that transit and, and, you know, that is, uh, as you rightly point out, that's not necessarily, um, that's not necessarily sticking a, a, a pin in the center of the building and drawing a half mile circle around it. Right. That makes sense. I can actually, um, in response to that, <laughs> don't worry Colorado Springs, you're all right, we got to it. Um, uh, in response to that, I can envision uh, downtown Burlingame, California, which probably does not need this tax credit, um, but one of their Caltrans, Caltrain, excuse me, stops, um, opens up on the left-hand side is the entire downtown. The right-hand side is a really large and lovely and, and heavily used city park. Um, but there is a grouping of houses that are just after that that people do live in and then walk to that station. So that walk shed to them is a little bit larger. You know, obviously weather conditions throughout the year are a little different. Um, but I can see where it would be a desirable tax credit to have, recognizing that those guys are going to walk and many people who live in that community do walk to that downtown for right. dinner and shopping and, you know, hanging right. out and things like that. So um, it's a good question, Colorado Springs. Yeah. No, and, I, and, and really I think that's, I, you know, I, I think it's important for us to, to think, you know, to, to think through those things because that, that sort of walkability is what we're trying to get at. Um, I can tell you that, um, you know, it's probably not practical, uh, you know, in, in the Internal Revenue Code to just say within the walk shed. So we're, we're going to have to be, <laughs> unfortunately, well, that is, well, that is what we're trying to get at. <laughs> um, we are going to have to be more precise. Um, the Internal Revenue Service is so prickly about such things. Gosh, those guys. I know. Um, <laughs> tax lawyers are terrible. Um, are there any other questions? Oh. Did we just drop off? Oh, perfect. There we are. Sorry, our screen went dark for a second. Um, all right, so there's any, if there's not any other questions, we can wrap this up and work on follow-up. Um, but I do want to thank you all for spending some time on, a, you know, a Thursday af mid-morning afternoon, depending on where you are in the country, talking about tax policy with us. It's, I mean, for, for some, it's very exciting, like Jeff. For others, it's a means to an end to be able to talk to you guys, like me. Um, uh, but really, we're looking forward to working with you all and uh, with, you know, with some other audience as well, audiences as well about um, how to really create this concept of uh, unrigging that federal tax code for smart growth. Um, so unless there's any other questions, if I haven't stalled enough, those are our contacts, Eric Yon at SGA, Jeff Ziarko at uh, Economic Policy Strategies, um, and I will follow up with you soon. But thanks so much again, guys. I hope you have a great rest of your day. We'll talk to you soon. Bye-bye.